Hello, everyone. My name is Jessica McDaniel. I'm a community liaison for the Central Arkansas Library System, and it's my esteemed pleasure to welcome you all to the Six Bridges Book Festival, presented in collaboration with the Central Arkansas Library System for today's session, which is a part of the Cal Speaker Series that honors Rabbi Ira Sanders. Today, I'll be sitting with Mr. Jermaine Fowler, New York Times bestselling author of The Humanity Archive, Recovering the Soul of Black History from a Whitewashed American Myth. Welcome to Little Rock, Jermaine, and we'll get started. Okay. Initially, um, the name of the book, I know that you have a podcast that is the Humanity Archive and you have a very vigorous Instagram presence and where you give a lot of historical facts. But let's start at the beginning. Why the Humanity Archive? Tell me about it. Yeah, I think the Humanity Archive for me, it started right in a place like this in, in a library. Uh, when I was 13 years old, I didn't see myself represented in history books at school. I would look through my history books and I'd see that Mount Rushmore, figures of black history, the MLKs, the George Washington Carvers. So I came into the library searching for myself, uh, got introduced to the black history section. You know, before then I didn't really read to investigate. I was reading comic books and, you know, things for entertainment, right? But that was the first real investigation, I think, into the human experience, trying to find myself in the library. So walked into the library, read myself out of the library. I started in the black history section, but in finding black humanity, I started finding humanity everywhere. And so read myself out of the library in all different cultures and, and uh, spaces and different histories from across the world. And uh, that really kind of gave me this idea that a smile has no nationality, uh, a tear has no ethnicity. And so that's always kind of been my foundation of this underlying humanity. So even if I zoom in on things like race or gender or some of those uh, more topics that are more complex and, and narrow, I could always zoom out to this universal thread of humanity that connects us all. So that's a driving force in my work. Okay, I absolutely love that. Um, while writing, did your thoughts tend to kind of navigate um, as far as dealing with just some of the way that we're programmed for black history. For example, when February comes around, there's a lot of mass marketing with everything for BHM. Do you think there'll ever be or can be a way where it is just history, just American history? Are we um, getting better with that in your opinion or do you still see that there will always be a need to single out Black History Month, Women's History Month, and some of the other categories that we tend to celebrate at certain times of the year. Yeah, I think we definitely see the, the commercialization of Black History Month, right? You can get an Apple Watch with, uh, you know, African colors on it. You can go to Target and you see this little section that has, you know, the, the Black History t-shirts and memorabilia. They had an Ida B. Wells Barbie doll. So I think that there will always be corporations that are going to try to capitalize on Black History. But I think it's an interesting story that I tell in my book where Carter G. Woodson, the, uh, the founder of Black History Month, he didn't want Black History Month to last this long. You know, he, he, his idea was to see black people in history, in American history, in human history, and not just separated and segregated on its own bookshelf, segregated in the bookstore, segregated into its own section. And unfortunately, we're far from that, I think. So Black History Month is still necessary because it's not being told as part of the larger narrative of American history or human history. So that's another big part of my book that I, I try to do, and that's another kind of ties back to that humanity archive idea of tying black history into the larger human experience and the American experience. I think that a lot of times when um, that time of the year rolls around, there's always a celebration, but I feel like when we're dealing especially with youth and in schools, you kind of get the polarizing figures um, where you hear about them over and over. And even, you know, being our age, I still see some of the lessons are still the same. Um, do you think that there are things that from an education standpoint, even though you're not an educator, you're a parent, that you would like to see that could probably um, help kind of invigorate what we view as black history? Yeah, I talk about in my book, uh, I kind of have this framework that I came up with for studying history. 
And a part of that is it's empathy, right? It's uh, having this idea where you're, you're walking in another person's shoes, where you're, uh, the history is felt. It's, it's uh, felt through the heart, right? It's not just uh, uh, facts and dates and uh, taught in this very dry and rigid way. Uh, it's, a, it's a way of teaching history, I think, that's dynamic. You're not just learning history from one book. Uh, you're, you're putting many books in front of kids and kind of allowing them to explore and develop through their curiosity in the study of history. Uh, and, and a lot of that has to do with the storytelling as well. A lot of uh, history, say if we're talking about African culture, a lot of indigenous culture, that's why they use a spoken word. That's why they use oratory uh, to tell the stories of history. They thought uh, something was lost with books. And so uh, as much as that hurts my heart because I love books, but um, <laughs> yeah. they, they thought, you know, the spoken word to be able to convey and get that emotion across in the, in the telling of history and keeping history alive and breathing life into history. So I think things like podcasting and, uh, you know, to things that can bring that storytelling aspect back to the history to bring it alive. And then I also talk about the Sanko. We got a little loud there. I don't know. <laughs> So yeah, I, I talk about the uh, Sankofa sensibility, uh, the word Sankofa meaning don't be afraid to go back and fetch what is at risk of being left behind. And that's a, a con word from West Africa, and uh, it's a philosophy of, of history. It's like standing on the shoulders of your ancestors. Uh, it's about going back and, and searching for the best of the past to bring the best of the past forward. So I think there are just more dynamic ways that we could talk about history, that we could study history, that I think will engage young minds more so than, you know, we're gonna talk about Jamestown, Virginia for, you know, a whole year, or we're gonna, you know, just talk about these dates and you're gonna take this test and check off some boxes, right? We really need to bring the history to life and, and make it felt uh, for, for kids. I totally agree. I know when we were in the back, I was telling you in the fifth grade, I learned the MLK speech, but really I'd heard it so many times to where I already pretty much knew it by the time I got that age and just such an important figure, but how there were people, um, other people lesser known that don't get as much recognition. So I definitely think that by getting more innovative as you, in, as you indicated, that that's a way forward. Um, as I read through the book, I noticed that there were actual historical facts, but more so you kind of frame world occurrences around them with more of uh, specific events and people discuss. It was kind of like to me, um, you got an opportunity when you were reading it to kind of peek behind a curtain a little bit, like you were looking behind a stage performance. As a researcher and historian, do you find the hidden layers of history more intriguing? And do you intentionally dive in looking for things that are hidden? Yeah, I think that uh, I'm always searching. Uh, you know, I've got stacks of books around. Like when I wrote this book, I'm just surrounded by books. Um, I locked myself in my office for like 10 months. I had to write the book in a very short amount of time, but I was like, how can I write a black history book that uh, covers is like everything really. So I, I was really ambitious in the writing of the book, but I think that is a driving force for me is that curiosity to go beneath the surface. I think that a lot of times we only get the tip of the iceberg. And so I wanna go beneath the surface and get that other 90% and like you said, pull that curtain back and see what's behind the curtain to see you know, what drove people, what drove their decisions, what drove their actions, uh, you know, what was their thought process. So part of that for me is uh, I love to find firsthand accounts uh, to bring the history to life, to see what the people themselves said about the history, to, uh, you know, feel what they felt. They tell, I mean, these stories are there, right? They told us how they felt. They told us what they went through. They told us about their struggles and their triumphs. So, you know, I'm always trying to, to reach for that part of history, again, just to bring the history to life and, and make it felt. Definitely, I definitely got that from, because um, it would just be um, a certain person and then you would bring something globally about, about it and I would be like, wow, that, that really does tie in. So that was definitely the feel that I got. Um, before part two of the book starts, you reference Reading Rainbow. And we're about the same age and Reading Rainbow was such a big deal to me when I was little. And honestly, I don't know about you guys, but I can't hear that theme song without it. Sometimes I cry. The lyrics did not mean a lot to me when I was small, but they are some really great lyrics to that theme song. And you indicated that LeVar Burton put it in your mind, the importance of investigating for yourself. Was that a hard lesson for you to learn when you were writing the book or just experience wise? Is there any story that you wanna share with us where you didn't do a lot of the investigating yourself and you found something else underneath? 
Yeah, I think that was very important to me. I think, uh, you know, when I read a lot of books, even history books, I mean, you could, every, every history is subjective, right? So I have my perspective that I'm going to bring to the telling of the story. Uh, but I, I don't think a lot of people admit that, though. You know, uh, they tell you kind of what to think, not how to think. So one of the main goals I had for the book was to tell people, you know, how I think about history, not just what I think about the events or the history. Um, that's why I kind of have this framework in, in the search for truth where I tell that Navarre Burton story. And I just remember watching Reading Rainbow as a kid. And then at the end, he's like, you don't have to take my word for it. And so to me, that let me know, okay, I can go beyond what somebody's telling me, right? To do this investigation for myself so that I could think for myself, so that I can draw my own conclusions. And again, that's why I advocate for reading more book, more than one book on the same subject, looking at uh, you know, different perspectives on a subject. So that's one of the reasons I started the book with uh, the Rosa Parks story, right? Everybody knows the Rosa Parks story, but a lot of people don't know that the civil rights movement, they disallowed women to speak in the beginning at the March on Washington. That's a perspective from her perspective that she talked about that a lot of people, if you're just telling this more narrow civil rights story, how it's normally told, uh, you're not gonna tell that part of the story. But you know, she was having no parts of that and she protested and women were allowed to speak at that march. But uh, you know, I'm always looking for every, every angle that I could find to tell the, the whole story. So that's the way I come at it. But that only comes from doing those investigations. And sometimes it's challenging, right? Because we have our, our worldviews, we could be stuck in our thought processes, and sometimes you, I mean, that causes you to have to go beyond that and challenge yourself uh, to go beyond what you think you know and sometimes say that you're wrong, right? So it takes courage to, uh, you know, speak the truth uh, as, as you see it, but also takes courage whenever you find new information to say that truth might have been wrong, right? And I don't think a lot of people are willing to do that. Yes, and definitely investigating for yourself. My grandmother used to say um, when we would go to church, she would be like, you know, the pastor gives us scripture, but you can read the Bible for yourself. I one time tried to hit her back. Well, if that's the case, then can I miss a Sunday or two? And she wasn't having none of that. <laughs> but it did put it into my mind that you do. You can pick it up yourself. You can investigate for yourself. You can ask questions. And I really applauded on that portion. Throughout the book, you reference countless examples of just the color black, um, what it means to be black, and the associations across it regarding religion, um, history, and just generally globally, what does black mean? Do you feel like it was important um, to kind of magnify that with telling the story of black Americans and our experiences? Yeah, I don't think you can uh, disconnect history and identity uh, so, you know, being a book of black history, it's largely about the black identity, what it means to be black, how blackness has been defined in history. And, um, you know, a lot of those definitions coming from outside of the black community, uh, you know, being a lot of stereotypes about black people, a lot of misconceptions about black people. So I really wanted to be innovative in a way of, again, launching that investigation. Like I got to go beyond what I know, beyond what these, uh, you know, kind of textbook definitions of what blackness is. And so, in my uh, chapter on culture and cultural appropriation, uh, I talk a lot about how blackness is defined. Uh, you know, you got the fried chicken stereotypes, you have, uh, you know, just all these stereotypes about black people and, and a lot of people associated with only with hip hop or, you know, these different things, right? Yes. But um, for me, I think blackness and black culture, specifically black culture, you know, has been defined by what black people have created in the fires, you know, pressed up against American racism against American oppression and um, you know whether that be the food culture whether that be the hip-hop or music culture or jazz or, or anything you're talking about a lot of that stuff was created like in the fires that were so hot uh, as I said could be measured in Kelvin's right so uh, people creating out of that and uh, you know black culture coming from that but uh, I, I thought it was very important to, to really dig into the black identity throughout history and what that's meant whether that be in the 15th century what, what that means now and how that's all kind of connected together, so I really wanted to launch into that. That was one of my favorite chapters, was the chapter on culture, just because um, it kind of polarized for me that a lot of times black Americans, to be successful, would have to lean into that and make that part of their identity, whether just to be successful, or how a lot of times when you're dealing with music or movies or any of those type of things where um, sometimes we weren't given a lot of credit um, for those. and. 
um, all of the great folks that have to do with entertainment. You hear the word culture so much now, I feel like it's something that we really should discuss. And so, um, challenges. I was intrigued by your willingness in the book to be transparent regarding other points of view and that in admitting that many scholars work kind of pushed you to kind of shape your thoughts and um, it pushed you to look at different factors and one example was dealing with um, economic and labor history so you made it look easy to kind of take into consideration, which I don't find that easy sometimes, especially if it's dealing with something like being a black American, because I'm like, I live that. But by taking another point of view and kind of considering it and thinking about changing your mind, so you made it look easy. What is, was it easy or was it a little bit challenging? Uh, I mean, it's always a, a challenge to, uh, you know, because a lot of the perspectives. I've, I've had these perspectives for over a decade, you know, two decades, however long it's been, right? So to be able to challenge yourself in that way, uh, to be able to say, I might be wrong about this if I'm, if I'm reading that different perspective. Uh, it, it's never an easy thing, but I think it's a necessary thing. Um, I think it's very easy for us to look out and look at, you know, things that are wrong in the world, but I think it's harder to look within, though, and say, okay, like, maybe I'm viewing this wrong, or maybe I could be looking at this differently. So, you know, if I found a, another historian or, or author that kind of challenged my perspective, I'll sit with it. Um, you know, I, I'll kind of pick it apart and see if that's something, you know, if there's parts of that that I agree with or not. Uh, you know, and if it is, I'll, I'll take it in. If not, I'll discard it. But there was a, a lot of things that I found just because there's a willingness to explore, right? I'm, I'm willing to read all these different books. So I'm going to come across a lot that's, that's challenging my way of thinking. And, uh, you know, I've kind of got to sit with that and, uh, you know, see what I'm going to take and what I'm not going to take. So. Gotcha. Um, black historians, they kind of, um, let's say you were having um, a rough night and you needed to go back for a reference or for some inspiration when you hit a roadblock. You mentioned 10 months and I'm impressed because I thought it took authors a whole lot more yeah. time than that. So uh, were there ever rough nights where you referenced any other black historians that kind of gave you some inspiration? Yeah, I think one of my biggest inspirations is uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, he's somebody who, uh, you know, in the 20th century, he had so much intellectual output, right? And, uh, you know, I, I don't think I've, I've seen a lot of examples of uh, black intellectuals who were able to kind of wrest history from oblivion as he did, you know, whenever they were saying reconstruction was a failure because of black people, uh, you know, black politicians, and he kind of rested and kind of reframed that narrative. He's somebody who, you know, put out like 20 books, multiple essays. I mean, he's just writing, 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 speaking, writing. So, uh, you know, I figure, you know, I look to him, right, to see, I and mean, that's kind of standing on the shoulders of scholars who've come before me. Uh, I wrote about a woman named Dorothy uh, Wesley Porter, who, whenever black history wasn't even categorized, it was only categorized in like two categories, uh, slavery, uh, that was basically it. So she recategorized black history. She was having to get uh, historical documents that had literally been thrown in the trash to bring back to life uh, at uh, Howard University. So, you know, I think about the Du Boises of, of history. I think about the Dorothy Porter Wesleys of history, and uh, you know, just kind of one of those things like, wow, if they could make it through that, like I can, I can crank this book out under this kind of kind of tight deadline. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I definitely um, agree. A lot of times, I feel like so much was lost and. That's the good thing about books and where that comes in to try and archive what we have, um, to try to take oral histories and just kind of don't forget. So kind of keep that in the forefront of our minds. Each chapter posed a quote at the beginning of the chapter and I thought that was interesting. And my guess is that they were not just to lead into the chapter or the context, but special to you in some way. The final chapter, the Crossroads of History quotes, we must go on struggling to be human by Robert Hayden. And um, that was from Words in the Morning Time. Why was that poignant for the finale? I think the whole idea of the book for me was uh, really getting into that idea of black humanity, uh, which I think that a lot of times in history, when you look throughout history, it's been a lot of uh, anti-blackness, a lot of uh, really trying to define what, what being human is, you know, and, and when people define humanity, like blackness and black people weren't a part of that uh, throughout a lot of black history. So I think to go on struggling to be human is uh, 
the, the message of the book is like black people are human, black people are part of the whole of humanity, right? So I think that's something that always has to be highlighted and that Robert Hayden quote really spoke to me and that, uh, you know, this idea, one of my favorite quotes is I am human, nothing human is alien to me, right? But I think that, uh, you know, just uh, a lot of times black history gets kind of pigeonholed into this, what I call anti-black history, which is why I wanted to separate that and say like that's what's been done to black history. Black history is actually what black people have done that is that human part, right? It is the innovation, it is the triumph. I think a lot of that's lost in the story of black history. So I really wanted to kind of separate that and say, okay, black human, like it's a fullness of and a richness of, of life, right? It's not just these stories of oppression. It's not just these stories of, uh, you know, slavery and uh, Jim Crow and, you know, that a lot of people focus only on that, but to be, uh, to tell the story in all of its humanity is to tell, you know, the good parts of black history too, the love, the triumph, the the joy, like all those parts of the history as well. So uh, that, that quote really spoke to me in that way of like, what does it mean to be human? And that means a, a 360 richness of experience. Were there any parts where, as you were writing the book, that you were worried about? Or were you worried about how it would be received? I know you say that you're not a conventional scholar and historian in that way. Could you tell us a little bit just about your background and how you feel like it kind of influenced the work versus um, someone who might have a more standard approach to what we see from historians? Yeah, I mean, I started, I say my alma mater was the library. Like, I didn't get a PhD oh, okay. in history. Um, you know, curiosity is my greatest credential. I'm just always curious. I'm always learning. I'm a lifelong learner. Um, so I think that is the driving force behind my work. But I think not being in, like, a, an ivory tower of academia, I'm able to kind of be a little more free with the way I tell stories. Um, I think I'm a little closer to maybe the average person and how they might uh, you know, try to navigate through history. So I think I'm kind of able to take people on a little bit more of a journey and put a little bit more of my perspective. And I, I feel like this book, you know, it's written a little bit differently and that I'm, I'm taking people on a journey with me. Like, come on, let's learn history together as opposed to kind of like this view of like looking down and telling a story from above, right? I kind of wanted to bring it to this down to earth. Like, okay, this is how I learn history. This is the investigations that I took. I want you to come with me and I want to teach you how I think and how I learned this history. So I think that really uh, informs my approach, you know, kind of being this history outsider, I guess, so to speak. Uh, but I think that brings me closer to the general public. And, you know, I'm always listening to, to see how people want to engage with history and the stories they want to hear. So I get influenced a lot by like, you know, maybe tell this story, maybe try that story. Uh, you know, and I'm always looking for, you know, those untold, I know he had talked before about uh, the story of John Hancock's here. Um, and he's somebody who was from Brinkley, Arkansas. So uh, just digging further, uh, you know, from a perspective of, you know, the outsider who's trying to bring these stories, because a lot of the stories are told in academia, right? They have the university presses, they're coming out with all these books, but a lot of times only the other historians are reading these books amongst each other, right? And right, there's there awards circulating. Clubs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So a lot of the general public isn't getting these stories. So, you know, I'm trying to be that middle ground between you know, the, the university and, and the general public. So that's kind of my space. Yeah, I definitely took the book as a sort of a roadmap, if you will, as far as tackling history. I know um, when we were talking about um, John from Brinkley in the background, I said I grew up less than 30 miles from Brinkley and I did not know that until I read the book. So um, that was very um, hit home for me and I did read it sort of, I didn't expect that, honestly. I thought you were about to take me just chronologically through a bunch of, um, a bunch of events and I was really surprised that it was more like a roadmap or a manual about how you tackle these subjects and bring light to black history. So I really enjoyed that. Um, do you feel like the black American experience is singularly different than that of other Amer Americans just because of the way that we came to this country? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you talk about forced migration, uh, you talk about, you know, the millions that, that came over, uh, you know, a lot through South Carolina, but um, you know, th there's no other experience that, that's comparable to that, right? So I think that that is unique in, you know, the black American story, uh, where those migrations and kind of how that culture was intertwined in America. Um, so yeah, there, there is no experience like the black experience. So I think to be able to zoom in on that and really hone in on that and talk about the specificity of the black experience, you know, and the complexities within that, you know, as opposed to 
other groups was very important uh, to tell the story how it needs to be told. But then, you know, not only focus on that for me though, so to be able to zoom in and zoom out at the same time. Uh, so although it's the humanity archive, you know, you got to talk about the specifics of the black experience, but then be able to zoom out to the human experience as well. Yeah. Race relations. Um, do you think that when you were writing this book, did it become even more polarizing to you that race relations today are what they are because of such a violent history in America, just not slavery, but even after when it comes with dealing with just the history of black Americans? Yeah, I think the, you know, the history of race, I mean, when you think about the violence, uh, I talk a lot about that in the section of anti-black history, starting with slavery, um, starting with, you know, how black people have been treated in America, uh, you know, whether it be laws against black people, uh, even, even starting in slavery, when you talk about free black people during slavery who weren't really free, right, and uh, the views and the, and the laws that were created specifically to target black people and how long it really took for those logs to be dissipated, right? But the attitudes don't really go away just because a lot of the laws were struck off the books. And so that's kind of what we're seeing now is that history is still brought forward. I think it was James Baldwin who said that the past is not past, the past is present. We carry our history with us. So, you know, a lot of people are not aware that they're carrying that, that history with them, but I think a lot of the attitudes, you know, that started from the very beginning of America, you know, when those laws were created, the word black was created, the word white was created, uh, to differenti differentiate and delineate people, uh, to categorize people and marginalize people, you know, all that, I mean, that stuff still carries forward to today and the attitudes and, uh, you know, and people trying to reinsert laws, you know, in more kind of uh, devious and deceptive ways to where, you know, they could try to pull the cloak over your eyes and they might not name it the same thing, right? They might use yeah. dog whistles, but it's still it's the same repeat, continuation, right? they'll repeat. So, uh, you know, we're seeing the history repeat in that way. So I think the, uh, anti-black violence uh, and that history is definitely carried forward in a lot of what we see today, especially when you talk about uh, what books are being banned, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, what history is being told, what history is not being told, whose voices are being heard, who's silenced. And, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of that now and, and just the ways that I think people need to wake up to. Uh, I think a lot of people are still asleep and things are happening kind of under the surface. Uh, I mean, it's definitely a national conversation, but I don't feel like the people are really woken up enough to really speak out against these things, though. I think we know that in this room, right, guys? <laughs> Definitely. Um, do you think that the experiences of our ancestors, our parents, grandparents, do you think that those experiences are affecting, still affecting our younger people just because they're a part of just our community? and how we are, even though it seems like time is moving and that we're so removed from some of these things, do you think that they're so ingrained in just culture when it comes to just our food, um, our attitudes, how we raise our children, even though we kind of might be finding our own way, there are so many deep-rooted cultural just norms that are singular to our community. Do you think that those are still affecting our younger people today? Yeah, absolutely, and I, I think that's, uh that could be in sometimes in positive ways, of course, uh, with the, what we use that word culture being passed down, uh, you know, those very rich histories and family histories, or whether you're talking about food or music or those things passed down. Like, but I also think a lot of the, the negative sometimes gets passed down too. A lot of the trauma gets passed down from uh, intergenerations. And, uh, you know, I think about my grandmother who was a sharecropper in Alabama, moved up to Louisville, Kentucky uh, through the Great Migration, right? And, you know, hearing her stories and some of the pain that she's felt and been through. And I mean, you know, some, you take some of that in, right? Uh, and it's not that long ago, uh, you know, I shared a story of the other day on my Instagram about how Samuel Jackson was a pallbearer at Martin Luther King's funeral. I mean, he's still playing in Marvel. He's got a Marvel show out right now, right? So, I mean, there's uh, a, not that deep of a, of a divide or a separation, uh, you know, and you see these black and white pictures, so it just seems like it's so long ago, but there's really a continuation in history where it was really yesterday. Uh, we're talking about our grandparents, we're talking about our great-grandparents. I mean, people who are still alive who were uh, going through these things or the people who were enacting a lot of that violence or, uh, you know, making a lot of those laws. I mean, they're, they're still here. So, you know, I think that is carrying forward to our children. Um, and I think that's another reason we have to tell the truth about history because the, the lies of the past can strangle the future. And that's when we're talking about our kids, right? So to be able to have a 
a fullness to the history to be able to tell the raw truth, the raw history, uh, you know, the good and the bad, the triumph and the tra tragedy together. But again, there's a lot of people who are trying to silence the, the tragedy side, you know, and anything, when you talk about race, when you talk about the black experience, uh, you can't silence that because that's, that's the equal part of it along with the triumph as well. Um, I saw an interview you did and the um, person interviewing you mentioned the Rosa Parks story and um, they said that Rosa Parks did yoga. And that was wild to me just because when I see pictures of her with the glasses and her hair pulled back looking very stoic, I would not have thought that. Do you feel like bringing out some of the simple daily everyday facts about some of our black history figures makes it um, a sense where we have a better connection with them that they weren't just these polarizing figures that had to be strong all the time, but they had lives and hobbies and things that they enjoyed and just some of the lighter things about them? Yeah, definitely. I think, for instance, with Rosa Parks, she liked yoga. A lot of people don't see that. They just see her as this figure that's unreachable, like unreachable heights, like this titan of the civil rights movement, right? And then maybe they don't feel like they could aspire to that. Uh, a lot of people don't know, like Malcolm X liked ice cream. I mean, there's something as simple as that, that like, I wouldn't think that'll so, give yeah. you like a, a, a human connection with him to where he's not just this, such a distant figure. Um, he was human, you know, he walked around like us. I mean, he definitely was a towering intellect and, uh, you know, somebody who fought against white supremacy, racism uh, in a major way, right? But like, these are people just like us. Uh, they did things that we could also aspire to and uh, bring about change in the world. So I, th I think that's very important to just look at the mundane. Uh, I've got a book like on my shelf at home right now. It's just a photo book of like just black people just living and, and, and family and community from history, right? To kind of take me out of the mode of, you know, just cause I mean, it's hard for me too to not to get stuck in, you know, a lot of the oppression narratives, uh, a lot of the, you know, slavery, lynching those narratives. Because even with, I noticed with my Instagram page, for instance, those posts on, uh, say if I'm doing something on uh, Ida B. Wells and how she fought against lynching, like those posts do better than the posts about like the love or the innovation or, you know, I could talk about how just right after slavery, black people, 50,000 patents black people got, you know, and the inventiveness of that, like fresh out of that oppressive state just to, to have such innovation and then uh, impact on America and industry. But, you know, if I share that story, it barely gets views and I think people, you know, they, feed into that, so I have to make sure I'm not feeding into that too and continue to balance the way that I tell history to make sure that I'm balancing the tragedy and the triumph. Love that. Um, looking back on your research and writing process, are there any specifics that you wish you'd expounded more now that the book is completed or are there anything that you would have added or taken away? Yeah, I think one of the benefits of writing a, such a broad book is that you know, I think if, if anybody was to look at one black history book and just be able to get a broad overview uh, and just some snapshots throughout black history and just get a, a deep sense of what it is through looking at the bigger picture, they're gonna get that with the book. But there were, you know, some challenges with that too, or there's some stories that I wanted to dive more into and tell more detail and, and flesh out more. Um, you know, whether that be the Rosa Parks story that we talked about, whether that be the John Hancock story, uh, and always having in mind, like I only have so many pages in the book that I can and write, right? I don't want to write a seven, 800 page book, but right. um, so even with the Hancock story, there's more I want, wanted to tell there and more that I wanted to research and explore. And, you know, maybe I could have taken a trip to, to Arkansas where he was from and kind of touched the soil and, and looked at the archives there and really brought out more out of that story. So there was probably a hundred stories that I, I would like to have done that. So I think in the future, I'd love to write a book where I'm just focusing on one figure and I could just dive all the way, you know, to the depths of that story and, and bring out as many details as I'd, I'd like, but uh, you know, so that was definitely a challenge in this book of, of writing a very broad history, going like back millions of years, talking about ancient black history in Africa, um, through the things that people know uh, from Reconstruction to, uh, and one thing that I did though is I kind of skipped over the civil rights movement just for that reason, because I felt like people already know about that. So I, I did include some stories from there, but, um, you know, I, I didn't want to really focus too heavily on what people already know. I wanted to kind of dive. So I, my depth came more from casting a wider net versus being able to dive into any one story, but I would love to do that in the future though. And I enjoyed that. Now I'm not gonna lie, when I had a, probably about 50 pages left, I started going back. I was like, did I miss something? Because I did notice that it was missing. But to your point, because it is so polarizing and it is like a big part of what we constantly hear about because it was so important. So I did enjoy 
hearing some of the um, other parts in time and how they're, they're tied together. Um, also, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, learning institutions and libraries. Um, do you think that there are things that um, our institutions can do to make black history more accessible? I know that you said the library was a haven for you, but um, for let's say people who are not as connected, are there ways that you think that we can reach them and make things more accessible to them? Yeah, I'm a really big advocate uh, you know, of meeting people where they are, and I think we see that uh, on, a, on an individual level with a, a lot of people. I, I don't know if I see that like as a national like library kind of thing of like meeting people where they are, or a campaign overall, uh, you know, with like, say, for instance, we're talking about the American Library Association or something like that, of like, we need to, you know, a lot of the people who come to the library, uh, you know, they're their supporters, they're, you know, of a certain demographic, but like, you know, you, a lot of the communities who could actually use the library the most, you know, for the, the richness of knowledge and the resources that it has don't make it here. So how do you go out and meet those people where they are to, to bring them to talks like this, to bring them to the library, to en uh, engage with the knowledge, to, uh, you know, partake in everything that the library has to offer? Uh, I think that's a big challenge. And, um, you know, I'm thankful for people like you who do it, like I said, and I'm, I'm sure there's many other kind of unsung heroes who are doing that, but I think uh, for black history specifically, I mean, you know, they'll lay it out be, uh, for the Black History Month on all the shelves and everything, but, uh, you know, how do we move beyond February to uh, bring that history to people and let them know that this is a place they can come to really deeply engage with their history and have programming and, uh, you know, different things where people want to come for that and they see themselves represented in that way. Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, since that's a part of my role, as you know how important it is to meet people where they are, to let them know things that are going on, and how important it is that you know you don't kind of lose that focus. You mentioned um, just polar. We've been talking a lot about polarizing figures. Um, were biographies something that kind of got you started regarding Black history? Was it solely biographies, or did you kind of enjoy like anthologies or things that kind of were more broad? Yeah, the first book that I picked up when I did uh, take that journey at 13 years old was this old book uh, it was from 1954. It's by Jay Rogers. It was called "A Hundred Amazing Facts About the Negroes." Like such an old book, it, it <laughs> smelled like like that old musty book smell, like vanilla and walnuts. I like I, you know, that. I just kind of <laughs> dusted it off. And um, yeah, that that's the book that really opened my eyes because he also took this broader view of history that he didn't see, but he wasn't, like he didn't have libraries like we have and uh, the ease of resources. So this is a man, J.A. Rogers, he's traveling to Europe. He's like going across the world to kind of rest this history and bring it back, right? So that was one of those foundational books for me that allowed me to kind of see beyond, you know, those, those Mount Rushmore figures that I talked about, uh, you know, beyond slavery to see like, you know, this rich African history, uh, black history, uh, you know, and this, this global black history and, uh, you know, also facts about America that were overlooked. So, you know, it kind of started there with the broad view, which I think influenced me a lot and kind of why I wanted to write a broad book as well, just kind of bring it full circle and bring it back home to that first book that I read that really opened my eyes to who I was and uh, allowed me to see myself beyond like the, the narrow stereotypes and the narrow history that I was reading uh, that didn't show black humanity. You know, it only showed people as part of the, the struggle you know, those civil rights stories and those slavery stories and those stories that only get pulled out during February. So, uh, yeah, I think for me, that's that's really what did it. I got you. Um, I think a lot of it, as I was reading through the book, I realized that there are just a lot of things that are, of course, hidden, but um, a lot of responsibility on us as a community to kind of bring those stories out. Now that you're into this work, do you feel a strong sense of responsibility for continuing the work? And is this something that you find yourself that you're going to want to do and expand on? Yeah, I definitely have a sense of responsibility. You just brought something up I think is uh, very important that uh, there was a study done. I think they said some over 90% of black people learn history from family and friends because I don't think a lot of black people trust the institutions. Like we've always known, I think that the institutions aren't going to teach us our history. So then, you know, we're, we're sharing books amongst ourselves and sharing resources amongst ourselves to make sure that we know our history. So, you know, there is, a, a I think, a disconnect uh, between the black community and the institutions. So, you know, there might be some institutions who are doing great things as well, but, you know, they, you know, there's that kind of historic disconnect of like, are, are they gonna be teaching us the, the real history or not, right? So, um, yes. you know, 
for me being somebody who is very connected to libraries and uh, again trying to bridge the gap, I do feel a, a big responsibility to uh, you know make sure people know that there are places and institutions they can go uh, to to get a deeper view of history. But you know there's a lot of, of weight and responsibility that comes with that to make sure I'm, I'm presenting accurate history to make sure that uh, you know I'm giving the people what they what they need. Gotcha. I'm having a good time. Am I good on time, Jay? I want to make sure we have time for questions. Okay, we're good. And I really wanted to know more just about, um, in regard to just some of the techniques that you use. When you were writing the book, did you do any traveling? Did you find that um, some places where you were looking for information where they might have been less than helpful when it comes to that? or? Uh, this was really uh, mostly a self-directed uh, journey for me. Um, again, I just got like every book I could think of. I mean, I was searching. It was a, a, a inner journey, I think, to where I was still finding myself in these stories. Um, so I, I do think, too, though, there is a, a lack of access in a lot of ways uh, with the archives, you know, the places that I'll tell the story, for instance, of uh, a historian, uh, he found, well, a historian, a student uh, in a history department at Columbia University found all these old underground railroad stories that had never been spoke of or discovered before. And these are firsthand accounts, uh, just rich details of people traveling across the underground railroad. You know, who do you think told that story? It was a, a white historian who got first access to these papers and was able to write this best selling book out of it. Same with the uh, Frederick Douglass story, there was a, and a lot of these are respected historians, but I think that just kind of speaks to this institutional like disconnect and who has access. Uh, the Frederick Douglass papers, a lot of uh, papers that hadn't been seen before that were kind of in this archive, uh, you know, again, written by a, a white historian. So it's like 80% uh, or 70 to 80%, you know, white males in, in, the, in the field who are able to get, you know, these stories. A lot of black history books are written by white people. And I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with that. The problem comes when, you know, black people who have been historically kind of marginalized from these spaces, these archives, uh, not having access to be able to tell our own stories uh, and, and everybody else getting to tell these stories first, right? So uh, yeah. I think that's a, a definite issue and something I kind of ran into in terms of like, you know, wanting to be able to kind of dig through those archives and not always having, you know, access as, as that outsider uh, versus people who are within those spaces and institutions. I know that you talked a little bit about um, Henry Gates and just how he has just a long, just a plethora of different things and how you always will find him kind of around the corner and something that he might have written or had a hand in that you didn't know. Is that a goal of yours? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, somebody like a Henry Gates, uh, you know, he's somebody who, you know, I look to in terms of just having that, you know, he's telling African folklore stories. I mean, everybody knows his show where he's like, going to the people, finding your roots, right? And yeah. uh, you can see the emotion, and, and I mean, so he kind of embodies that fullness of bringing history to life, not only through writing. Uh, I see him as kind of like this W.E.B. Du Bois figure, too, because his intellectual output is just, uh, it's astronomical what you know he's able to do. So I, I think that is definitely somebody that I aspire to, to be able to you know, connect with people on an emotional level with history and bring the stories to life, and then also continue to write books, you know, uh, it, being in my case from different angles of history, uh, whether it be diving to a biography for the next book or taking a broader view or whatever that is. But uh, I think people, I'm, I'm glad for people like Gates and those kind of scholars who came before me uh, who were able to kind of pave the way for, for what I do. Love it. Um, previously for the, the Same Cow series, I interviewed um, Nell Irvin Painter, mm -hmm. and you mentioned her um, in your book. And just um, kind of some of those figures that are kind of have taken it upon themselves to take up the mantle of researching and making black history something to where that it is accessible to people. I know we had a conversation in the bank just about how some communities dealing with technology and broadband and mm -hmm. how there's still such a need for us to be able to have accessibility to kind of continue the work. And so I really appreciated just all the, the willingness of you to acknowledge you know, other scholars, even though you're taking your own spin on it. Do you feel like um, when it comes to, we were talking about the algorithms and things like that with technology and Instagram and all of that, do you find um, sometimes that it's a situation where some people on your post 
that don't have a like-minded point of view? Do you find that to be something that's hard to deal with? Um, or people who kind of don't understand why you're doing the work and like, well, it's black history. You have a month and mm -hmm. we all know these things and look at all of the resources that you have. How do you handle the naysayers? Uh, I, I don't find it hard on uh, online. I'm just like block, block. You know, the, the block finger is, is block very finger strong, strong, but <laughs> if, um, if somebody's really, if somebody has a differing point of view and they're really willing to engage like in a, in a debate or in a discussion, so I'll, I'll definitely active in the comments and uh, you know, within the, those social media spaces to be able to, again, because I'm not afraid to have my views challenged. Uh, so if somebody proves me wrong, then I'm willing to adjust. But uh, I think there's a lot of people in the online spaces too who don't have any kind of good intentions. They're just there to uh, kind of bring, I mean, it brings the whole community down, you know, when you have people who are just constantly just, you know, trying to undermine or uh, I don't think who are there for any, any good reason to uh, learn or to grow or anything like that. So uh, those, are, those are the people who I kind of tend to push out of the community, but then, you know, uh, people who are willing to engage in a deeper discussion, whether they agree with me or not, uh, those are the kind of conversations that I'll spend my time to, to have with people. So, um, you know, that's definitely been enriching for me uh, to, to kind of have that space to go to, to kind of see how people are thinking, what they think, and um, not just being in that space where I only want people to agree with me, right? Like if right. there's something you don't agree with or if uh, there's a different perspective or if I got a date wrong or just whatever that may be, like we could talk about that. And um, I really wanted to go back to that point too where you were talking about how I reference a lot of black historians in the book, um, even specifically to where I like, would put a parenthetical reference in the actual, like on the page. Yes. And I think that's kind of a part of what I wanted to do for the community building as well. Um, you know, to, to have a space where I have a lot of people like looking at my work and to be able to kind of shout out other black authors and to be able to kind of bring focus, not just on myself, but others as kind of the community that I want to build in terms of, uh, you know, just that connection and be, just telling people that I'm connected to a much larger body of work with all these different black scholars who, flowers. yeah, exactly, exactly. I love that. You talked about growth a lot and um, at the kind of the prologue, you just talked about your journey as far as black history and all of these different pinpoints of things or subsets of categories that you went through, like where you were like all in from Afrocentrism. And so can you talk a bit, a little bit about that gist of your life journey from being a younger person and your influence and how you kind of got to this more where it's a little bit more broad and a little more open? Yeah, that's where challenging myself comes in because I, I was really, came up in such a way where I was, uh, you know, immersed very deeply in, in black culture and uh, what I might consider, you know, thought that's really, uh, sometimes it became narrow, I think, in, in terms of, um, you know, every everything was black, right? Uh, everybody in ancient Egypt was specifically black. Uh, you know, uh, there's arguments about black people coming to America before Columbus. Uh, I mean, but I, I think sometimes the evidence didn't really always align with that, but it kind of, um, aligned with the way that I wanted to see the world and not always, the evidence wasn't always there to even support some of those claims. So I, for a long time, I mean, I was very deep into what I would consider like that Afrocentric history. I'm reading just all the books that are really focused on that. And I think for, in some ways that was a shield, right? Because when you grow up hearing, you know, over and over again, I mean, it's not been that long ago since they said black people didn't have a history to speak of, right? right. Uh, black people didn't have civilization to speak of, right? So. Um, I think it was a, a difficult journey for me and a challenging journey to come out of more of that narrow view of black history to, uh, to broaden my lens. But uh, ironically, in doing that, I found more black history, right? Because say, for instance, I was stuck like in, in ancient Egypt and uh, tied to that when I moved beyond that worldview though, then I go right below Egypt to somewhere like the Sudan who has like more pyramids than ancient Egypt, right? So there's all this like black history there, right? But only by Open broadening, doors. yeah, only by broadening my worldview, I actually found more black history in that way than kind of staying in this kind of narrow framework that I was in. So, uh, but yeah, it was a definitely a challenging journey. I, I was stuck for, for a while in that. Gotcha. What are your hopes for the reader that picks up the Humanity Archive? I think uh, I want the book to be, uh, you know, a mirror in a window, no matter who reads the book. I mean, if, if you're black, I want you to see yourself in, in the book and the stories of uh, your ancestors and those who came before you. But even if you're, you're not black, I want you to see yourself. And that's kind of what speaks to bringing that black humanity to life. I want you to see a mirror to 
uh, you know, the trials, the tribulations, the triumphs, the, the wins and, and the losses of, of black history and black people and, and see yourself in those stories and feel those stories and, and find empathy in those stories and, uh, you know, help that to shape your worldview, you know, about black people and, and black history as a whole. So I really want people to see black humanity when they read this book. Uh, and then not only the, the mirror, but the window to the possibilities of what you can be uh, based on what, you know, the people who came before us have been able to do and what they've been able to overcome. All right. And now we'll have questions. If you would, if you do have a question for Jermaine, if you would come up the center aisle to the mic so that we could hear you and hear your question. Hi, um, thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to reading the book. And I'm just curious how you handle issues of intersectionality and the diversity within the black community. And you know, just some examples of, you know, I think a lot of what we read in black history about the black community is how important the church has been. Mm -hmm. But there are plenty of black people who aren't Christian. You know, and when we think about you know, some of the different cultural traditions that come from set, sort of the roots of the southern, you know, southern migration, but then we, there are lots of blacks who are immigrants. And I'm just sort of wondering how, how you deal with that complexity and sort of what your thoughts are about um, the role that that plays in telling the black story. Yeah, I, I, that's very interesting. I actually tackle that in the book in terms of, uh, you know, I, I grew up black and Christian and, you know, that I kind of had a narrow world, a narrow worldview when it came to like the telling of black history from that lens of black Christianity. But, um, you know, as you said, there is this such a diverse amount of black experiences that, that go beyond that kind of narrow framework. So in the book, I really wanted to, to move past that. I mean, I talk about uh, black people who are in the Catholic Church. I talk about uh, traditional black religions who people who kind of stay tied to the, their, their African traditional religions and brought those over here and kind of what that looked like and um, really move beyond just the kind of that Christian, uh, you know, black framework to be able to tell those stories and kind of broaden that lens. So for me, I think that that really speaks to that humanity part of it to where like to be human is to be able to be broad and like black people are so much more than just what the stories that are normally told, right? I mean, there's black people across the spectrum of religion, across the spectrum of political thought uh, you know, from not just black people who fought for democracy, but, you know, you had a large black radical tradition that people don't always talk about. Uh, you even have black conservatives that I talk about in the book uh, and, and what that looked like. And so I, I really try to go broad in, in the black experience to, uh, you know, show that black humanity, that black people have been anything that they wanted to be and everything that they uh, aspire to or wanted to be in that way. In your work, you really emphasize the importance of empowering black people to tell their own stories. I'm a public history educator, and I find that it's difficult to both recruit and retain black students and keep them in working in the cultural field. Is there any advice you could give about how we could make those programs more inclusive and ways that we can retain black talent in, in the cultural field? Yeah, that's a, that's a big question, I think, because uh, there's so many aspects of that from, uh, you know, economics, I think, is a large part of, you know, depending on the institution and what that looks like for people in terms of, uh, you know, making a living and, uh, you know, so, I mean, ultimately, like, that's, that's a huge part of it, but I think, um, you know, we, we you, I think you have to have a lot of times, it's kind of a catch-22, right, because you need people from the black community to reach out to the black community, but a lot of these spaces don't have a lot of people from the community to go to the community to reach out. So um, again, I think it just goes back to the idea of, of meeting people where they are. Um, you, you gotta go where people are, you know, even if it's uncomfortable, uh, whatever that looks like. Um, you know, a lot of people aren't gonna come from outside of these communities to these institutions. Like it's gotta be, you know, whatever that looks like. And some, some of it could be online, some of it could be actually putting feet on the ground, you know, whatever that looks like. I mean, it's gotta be a, a concerted campaign to go out and, and get people, you know? So, uh, you know, that's what I would speak to is just meeting people where they are, I think is the, the biggest factor for that. All right. Thank you so much for being here. This was a great talk. I have not read the book. <laughs> I look forward to doing so. So this question is kind of from the perspective of uh, this might be contained in your book, but, you know, acknowledging that it's not your or black people's responsibility to have the answers. I wonder, we've touched on Black History Month. I know 
politically, there's a lot of talk about critical race theory. If you could propose some recommendations for how to really integrate, <laughs> and I recognize that that word is loaded, but integrate what your, your research in um, this book has uncovered, how can that be more a part of mainstream so that we don't have, you know, a 28-day period where, you know, it feels highly commercialized and consumerized, um, or we don't have critical race theory. It's like the, um, somehow the, like, dog whistle code word for talking about black history. What would be your ideas for how we can truly make American history represent the black experience? Yeah, I mean, I think in, in some ways it's a, it's a war on, on ignorance. There's a lot of people who are comfortable with the narratives as is and kind of this single American story, uh, this kind of patriotic history. So I think it's definitely that, uh, you know, idea of what I call the, the 1619 versus 1776 um, to where, you know, have the 1619 side who's saying, yes, like, systemic racism still exists, like that's very much part of American history, and then you kind of have that 1776 side who says, you know, we stamped all that out with, uh, you know, the civil rights movement, and we can move forward now in the, the progress, right? I think you have to stop telling history as, as a single narrative. I think as long as we have this single story and, uh, you know, this idea that, that it has to be taught in this patriotic kind of uh, monumental history way where we are just uplifting these figures and we can't be critical of the history, but we're going to get the same thing over and over again. So I really advocate, again, for telling history from more than one book uh, to bring in those different perspectives. And, uh, you know, I, it's, it's, a, it's a battle, though, because, I mean, again, you're seeing the, the book bans. You're seeing people who want to kind of stay in that, that narrow ignorance. So I think it's, it's going to continue to be a fight uh, to broaden the, the approach to teaching of history. Uh, congrats on the success of the book, obviously, New York Times, best-selling author, that's amazing. And you also have a strong online presence, and you're, um, my question would be about how do you feel like you've been able to translate from academic researchers to a really receptive public, right? You're telling stories that have been researched, but they haven't reached people, so where do you think you've found your sort of success in bridging that gap from knowledge to presentation uh, and what do you think that other historians could unlock from your success to reach bigger audiences as well? Yeah, I think for me it's it's the storytelling. I mean, people engage with stories. I mean, you think about human history and just the, the sitting around the fire and hearing a story. You think about uh, the oldest human story being some like 43,000 years ago, the cave painting, you know, of a hunting scene. And, um, you know, I think a lot of times with history it's uh, kind of stuck in this factual really rational kind of framework to where the, that storytelling is not incorporated. So I think that's why you see like, you know, a lot of kids are learning history from TikTok now versus like how it's being taught in school from, from the textbook because the storytelling and being able to kind of tell those quicker, snappy stories um, and still have important lessons within those stories uh, to end the story with. But for me, it's just, it's all about the storytelling, uh, whether that be in short form in 60 seconds or, you know, larger from the book. But I think that's kind of where the, meeting people where they are. Again, a lot of people are engaging with history in uh, more bite-sized ways now. So me just being able to see the trends and uh, meet people where they are and how they're engaging with history. And then the great thing about that then is, you know, I'll kind of draw them in with these more shorter form stories and then hook them in with the book right to where they can get a more deeper view. So I think, uh, you know, I think a lot more people need to embrace that of like meeting the public where they're learning history versus being insulated, you know, within these institutions and, and not going out and meeting the public where they are. This probably sounds like a naive question, but um, we all hear about how there's a backlash um, against um, teaching, you know, real African American history and, and telling the truth about, you know, the ugly truth about things that have happened. Uh, I'm speaking of, uh, you know, public education in particular. Um, but I was wondering if you had any opportunities to, uh, or invitations, or if there's any sort of inroad that you've had into um, 
um, being able to speak to kids in public schools and um, you know, um, colleges and things like that. Has the door been shut in your face or have you had any opportunities to, to uh, speak to them and to? Uh... Yeah, I actually, uh, there's, there's, again, there's a lot of people who do want these stories told. I don't think, I mean, cause you know, the media definitely is gonna show more of the, the divide and, and that's real, but I, I think there's also people on, you know, individual levels and, and on, you know, smaller scale institutional levels who will reach out and like, hey, we saw this, we really want the kids to, to learn, you know, some of the ways that you're teaching history. So I'm um, very involved with my local public school and the social studies director there uh, and, and bringing, you know, the podcast specifically and as a way to bring history to life uh, in a way that I think a lot of kids engage with now uh, through that storytelling of the podcast and then kind of making lesson plans out of that. <clears throat> um, definitely get a lot of uh, universities who will reach out uh, to me as well. So I think there's definitely people who are, are recognizing the need for this kind of history and, and want to really, uh, you know, kind of be, so to speak, on the right side of history of like, you know, we do need yeah. to tell this truth and we do need to figure out, hard as it may be, like how to incorporate this, whether there's backlash or not, or, you know, the, whether we get pushed back or not. So there's, there's a lot of people out there who are, are doing that work. Do you see any positive change in that, uh, in that aspect? I mean, again, all we, we hear a lot of negativity um, about it, but do you see any, any positive changes? I, I, I do, if, if I zoom in, I think to the community level, uh, when you look nationally, yeah. I mean, again, there's this greater divide story that I think is always kind of gonna be told, but if you go to yeah. specific communities and you talk to individual people and you go to individual institutions, I think uh, a lot more work, a lot more of us can recognize like from a community level of the work that's being done, but it's hard to see when you only kind of have that broader national view uh, for sure. Well, thank you for being here. We appreciate thank you. It. I loved what you had to say about libraries and the importance of institutions in how they can kind of bridge the divide between the academic world and the public world. As a longtime library worker and current archive worker, I'd love to know more about your vision for the future. Where, where do you see all this going? I, I mean, for me, I just wanna, I wanna keep telling stories. Uh, you know, my idea is to build my own archive, you know, the archive that I wanted to see uh, of, of marginalized history, of overlooked history, uh, and just keep on adding to the archive in different ways, whether it be uh, more stories through books, more stories through uh, podcasts, uh, or just any of the different mediums, uh, video format, or just whatever that looks like to continue to expand this archive that people can go to and see themselves represented uh, in, in history. And everything that you've said about uh, just the, the level of civilian lay engagement with uh, with history by average people, that that's just amazing. Thank you so much oh, for mentioning all thank this. Thank you, today. I appreciate it. Hi, um, my name is Ecola Walker, and I just really wanted to give you kudos. Um, I came across your work on Instagram, and I'm a mom, I'm originally from Detroit, so I was one of those that were kind of Im immersed in the black culture, and coming here to Arkansas, it's so much rich black culture here also. Um, so I just wanted to give you your kudos because your work allows for me to um, teach my children at the kitchen table because they're not taught that in high school. I mean, well, I have two in high school and two in elementary, um, but that allows for me to have those conversations around the kitchen table. And so when they go out, they're challenging their Arkansas history teacher like, okay, it's more than just slavery and civil rights <laughs> because we talked about that at the kitchen table. So I just wanted to say thank you for your work and I look forward to reading your book. Thank, yeah, you. thank you for sharing that with me. Like more than anything, hearing stories like that or people writing to me or just telling me the impact that it's making is like, I, I feel that to the, to the heart. So thank you so much. In addition, my elementary school children's um, librarian, she is awesome and she keeps those stories rich. It's just a pleasure to be able to walk into the library and see those stories out. Um, so our children can make that, normalize that basically. So. Thank you. Thank you. 
I know that we have two um, addi additional questions, but um, we seem to be running out of time. We're going to let um, Jermaine go out to our writer's table, so you can see him out there. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. Let's give him a hand. I enjoyed this thoroughly. And thank you for all the support for our local library. Y'all keep supporting local libraries. Even if you're not checking stuff out, come and see us. Say hello. We could really use the support right now. <laughs>